Hello and good day. Uh, my name is Chuma, Chuma Chuma Obi. I know it's a cool name. Uh, welcome to Platform Quan. I hope you're enjoying your conference. Um, a bit short on time, it's a 15 minute presentation. There's a lot to go over, so I'm going to go straight into it. Now, I'm going to be talking about um, Open Policy Agent, um, OPA, and how we've actually used um, it to um, alongside with Terraform Enterprise. All right. Awesome. So in this talk, I'm just going to cover what OPA is, the general objective of what we wanted to do and accomplish here, the existing controls that we had uh, prior to you know, introducing OPA, um, our OPA approach, uh, the workflow that we actually put into it as well, um, and a slight demo for you. Uh, this demo is pre-recorded. Uh, as you would know, uh, demo gods are rarely ever on your side in this kind of scenarios. So uh, try to bypass the demo gods and have a pre-recording um, for, for this to work. And um, I will not be taking questions for obvious reasons because it's a pre-recorded demo. And uh, yeah, without like, you know, with less talk again, short on time, let's get into uh, what this looks like. All right, so introducing to OPA, what is OPA? Open Policy Agent is an open source general purpose policy engine that unifies policy enforcement across stack, right? It provides a high level declarative language, Rego, that lets you specify policy as code and offload policy decision making from your software. If that doesn't make any sense, it's fine. Um, if you are new to OPA, if you're new to um, this entire security structure or actually this control structure, um, uh, please don't be don't be modified by that. All right. So, like I said to your counting in the slides, if you've never heard of OPA before, all that stuff I just said doesn't make any sense. All right. So let's start off bit by bit. What is a policy? Policy is literally what that is. Like, right? <clears throat> it's a set of like it's think of policy as any law enacted by Congress, right? Like, like as any house and body that you are um, familiar with. So in this situation, though, as a developer, um, you are Congress. You have a set of rules that you want to govern a certain like, kind of behavior for your platform or your software. So what does OPA do here? OPA is basically a, a policy engine that you can entrust to implement and enforce those policy decisions for you, right? OPA is many times uh, confused as a security tool. Uh, yeah, it's here to improve security in this ways, but while it's allowed to, you know, while it's definitely used to improve security, as you would see in this demo, um, it's capable of so much more. Um, why did we choose to use OPA? OPA is super lightweight, um, super lightweight. Um, it's ubiquitous um, because it can be used as a library in your code, like Java, Python, Golang, all of it. It can be used as a client server with OPAL, OPAL. Um, it can be used as a sidecar in the Kubernetes. It can be used as um, a daemon set in Kubernetes, uh, a gatekeeper library. It can be used in, like literally in the repo. It can be used in the CI. There are multiple plethora of ways it can be used. So it actually makes it added benefit to why we can use OPA. All right? Policy de decoupling. OPA also allows you to take the load of implementing policies off the service or the software and allows you to ship things faster. So think of when you have a JSON or you, you have a JSON that your app has to vet and the JSON attributes has to have everything required for your app to work. Any introduction of a new attribute would mean re-modifying and redeploying your code. If you move that decision-making off to OPA, your code stands. It becomes a layer of gate before, you know, like your platform or your service is introduced to that. So it takes care of the policy decision for you. Right, without having to modify and redeploy the source code. Awesome. So, what's the situation that we have in our hands? Right, um, we have a multi-tenant GCP environment, and it is managed by Terraform. Uh, Terraform Enterprise, as I stated before. Now, in a multi-tenant situation, how do you ensure safe practices um, while remaining, like you know, flexible for all your tenants? Right. Uh, now, the first approach we had on it is have SRE play gatekeepers. Right. Um, we thought that was a good idea. It made sense. If anybody's trying to introduce any, like, you know, Terraform changes, we bet it, we say it's okay, and they can be introduced. Now, for obvious reasons, there are downsides to that. One of which is massive, massive toil on the SRE team. Um, uh, we've seen our SLOs, or we saw our SLOs rather, grow over time um, uh, from, you know, the implementation of Hey, we're the gatekeepers for you. Um, to you know, um, over the years it went from 
yeah, we can get back to you in a couple of hours to, yeah, we can't get back to you soon enough. There's so many of you put in requests at any point in time, right? What that means transitively, again, is we've become the bottlenecks for development, right? Now we're actually stifling innovation at that point because we couldn't keep up with the requests. Now we can go hire more members to just sit down and vet, you know, um, Terraform changes, or you can automate it in a, in a certain way. Now, even if you hire more members, it is prone to human errors, right? Because, and we've actually, we actually saw a case of this where a new member to the team wasn't really familiar with the process. I was entrusted with the keys to the, you know, to the kingdom and, um, nuked hundreds of pop subs, right? And left like four of them. Uh, so yeah, it's not an infallible solution. So we needed to find something quickly. Um, and we opted for OPA. So what was our objective? Our objective is to minimize toil as much as possible, right? Like to the, like as much as we can to elevate that toil from on the team so we can actually, you know, be focused on like all the things that we have to work on. Um, keeping security a priority, um, obvious, obvious reason, like, you know, we have TFE Terraform Enterprise, which is handled by a, a whole team in Home Depot, um, to implement Terraform in all the spaces that cross multiple teams. Um, uh, HashiCore uses Sentinel as its own policy, um, um, uh, engine. Um, that's also going away. HashiCore, uh, not so recently, actually a while ago, has opted to also go for OPA, right? So, but in the current structure that we had at the time of, you know, like this is an MVP approach. We've grown past this, but like I'm just showing the MVP approach. But at the time of implementation, TFE went with, Sentinel for a company wide um, security uh, posture. And then we also OPA as an added security posture as well, as you can see. And it also introduced flexibility to the model where teams are actually able to do a lot of things and keep going without us having to, you know, stifle them from innovation. So the existing controls, all we really did um, prior to OPA was basically saying branch protection on the main branch, right? And like, you know, code owners where our teams are the only ones allowed to basically approve pull requests. Um, and every pull request has to be approved by the team before it can go. Otherwise, it's not going anywhere, right? Um, so our OPA approach brought in like, you know, deny a warn uh, policy. So that for the MVP approach, again, we've grown past this. Uh, all we did was introduce um, multiple resources. Uh, we're a GCP shop, so multiple resources that team have frequently, you know, kind of requests to do and attach weight to it. So we just kind of used our experience um, on having to review multiple pull requests and Terraform changes to basically ascertain what the weights are. So if somebody's trying to create, update, or delete a pop sub topic or BigQuery table, et cetera, et cetera, we want to assign weight to it and then also want to start modifying the blast radius. So in the case if somebody wants to delete a pop sub topic, that is over the blast radius, so we're not going to let them do that. But if they want to create a pop sub topic, it's fine. If they want to create five of them, it's also fine. But if you want to create a sixth one, we want to also vet what that is, right? So again, MVP approach, we wanted to see how this was going to work. Um, and you know, we don't want to over automate it because, well, we weren't sure yet. Like we wanted to make it operationalized and make sure how it works. And this was a really good first introduction because it's alleviated our toy by like 25%, which was impressive. And we've actually gone on to alleviate set tour even further with, you know, other um, means at this moment. Cool. So our journey for this, I'm going to for the sake of time, if you're using Terraform Enterprise, uh, uh, please understand that with having a remote backend, gives you a limitation because you require um, a structured data in the form of JSON, um, in this case, to be able to pair it up with OPA, the policy that you've written with Rego, um, to be able to kind of like make a decision, right? So Rego is written to be like, you know, the declarative, like decision, uh, declarative language for um, OPA decision making, but it also needs data to basically say, oh, this is what's coming in. I'm going to make a decision based on the data coming in. So. It's, it's a huge limitation with, um, the remote backend from HashiCore slash Terraform. Uh, we had to work like our way around it. We stumbled massively, um, for multiple ways that I can't really get into for the, like, you know, sake of time before we can actually get to our location. Right. So what was our approach? We, we, we allow some that basically has like very little changes and fall into the approved list. 
And if we are unable to determine like the automation, like, you know, um, if it's, if it's as easy, if it's ambiguous, we kind of leave a warning for it and leave it for manual validation by a human SRE member. And then some that are security threats um, are basically going to be flat out denied, right? As I will show you momentarily. Okay, so <clears throat> how we have the workflow going now, a pull request triggers Jenkins. Jenkins goes over to Terraform, pulls out the plan um, from that pull request. And then the plan JSON is combined with the, the policy rego. And from there, a decision is made on either success is easy, is slow, keep going forward, you're fine to go. There's a warning that, like, you know, waits for a human validation to so move that SRV team, or it denies you um, and tells you, you know, what the, the reason is and the fix it. So we're going to PR, right? Awesome. I'll just get into the demo real quick. No time to waste. Uh, we're short on time. So again, pre recorded. So I'm just going to show you what it looks like. Now, we're going to talk about auto approval, right? So I'm going to make a, a code change on a pop sub topic. Very easy, just creating a pop sub topic right there. Match attention, blah, 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 all of it. Cool. Raise a pull request based on that. And um, that triggers a Jenkins, comes back, you know, you can see the approval list. Uh, pop sub topic has a weight of 10. So I'm just creating one, which is well less within the blast radius. And it says everything's fine. Um, and from there, right? Your pull request is automatically approved. It actually even tells you, hey, your pull request is automatically approved because, you know, well, it's low risk. We don't care. Um, just go ahead and just run the app button apply and you should be good to go. All right. And next up, we're going to like, you know, talk about the wall. That's simple enough, easy peasy. That's what we want um, for that to happen. Uh, and the one situation in some spectrum of things, we don't know what's happening. As you can see in this place, someone is trying to delete an IM member. And that could be potentially dangerous. I mean, at that point in time, we hadn't automated enough of this stuff. And it tells you, hey, I'm going to wait and pen for manual validation. Now, um, you can see right up here as well, it's telling you, hey, the warning, um, the resource changes to that particular resource, Google pops up subscription IM member is significant and cannot be auto approved. Contact an on call member um, to, you know, to kind of vet it manually. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm not sure what's going on with my voice here. Um, simple enough, straightforward. Um, yes, it requires our human intervention, but not the end of the world. It's actually elevating a massive amount of toil for us, right? Uh, once validated, we just come in and click approve, and everybody's good to go. We're one big happy family after that, right? Uh, next up, a flat out denial. Now, if you are used to Google um, IM, right, like what happens with, with binding is if there's an existing binding of a role to, uh, to a set of entities, if you introduce that set of, you know, that similar set of binding to the same role with new entities in a different code, Terraform isn't aware. What happens is the previous bindings gets nuked, right? And the new bindings take place. So if you had a seven entities bound to a role, and you didn't know about it in the Terraform code, and you come and introduce a new entity to the same role, the previous seven entities are gone. So we we were bitten with that before. So what we had done was to actually kind of like, you know, pull from the plan, make sure that all the bindings are, you know, like are set. And if any new binding is introduced, it's going to stop anybody. As you can see in the deny role, it tells the person, yeah, this role that you're trying to, you know, have a binding to is already utilized. Um, by another binding called the like, Google Code I am by the KMS admin. Any changes to this rule would wipe out the members already bound to the resource. So it became a way of us to like, you know, have an added security. Um, and all, all, honestly, this is also kind of like, you know, eliminating that human errors uh, spectrum because we wouldn't have a way of actually vetting all the code and knowing if it previously existed, right? So it became like a, a massive, massive, like, you know, uh, improvement and on, on, um, uh, on our, our, our policy structure. Uh, that's the end of the demo. Um, the last thing I want to cover that anytime we introduce a new rule, anytime we introduce a new policy, we also have unit testing that we've actually, like, you know, added there. It's like OPA test allows you to run a, a test scenario, uh, for unit test of what you've introduced to make sure that all your policies are succeed as ad intended. Um, I know it's short on time. Um, it's been, I hope this talk has been like, you know, um, helpful to you. Um, and I hope you enjoy a good time 
enjoy OPA, exploring OPA as much as I did. Uh, heads up, Rego, it's not a very intuitive language to get started with, but once you get accustomed to it, um, it's one of the like is easiest, one of the easiest declarative languages you ever get to play with. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I've had so much fun talking to all of you and enjoy the rest of the conference.